So I'll be talking about reg log the game. Um, uh, so here's a picture of Tom Cruise doing something very important in the 2002 movie Minority Report. And what I'll say following this has very little direct relation with that movie, but it's just kind of an analogy for your, for your mind. You, know, you can think of someone playing seamlessly with logic. So someone's taking logical concepts held by a computer and manipulating them, putting them together to solve crime. Um, and this is brought to you by this idea we have uh, for a, a game, some software we want to create called Regular Logic the Game, Reg Log the Game. So imagine you're an investigator on the case, and you're, you're adding to and narrowing down a set of suspects. Okay? And what you can do is you can pull up cells from a computer's database. So there's, you pull up my suspect as this person port, you drag it over, attach it to acquainted with, which also has a person port, and you define POI, a person of interest, to be the result of connect someone that my, a person that my suspect is acquainted with. Okay, so that's something you can do. You can add to the system beliefs about the world. So you can say, I believe that if two people work at the same startup, then they're acquainted. So uh, works at is a relation between people and companies. Uh, startup is a subset of companies. And so you can read this almost like, the, like just a concept web or like an English sentence or something. You can look at this thing and imagine someone who doesn't know any logic um, just seeing a person works at a company, which is a startup, which is worked at by another person. And that that entails that the two people are acquainted. You could add that in any case, or it's true that my suspect is acquainted with the victim. So you can add. So you can read these almost like English. Or almost like, um, you don't have to really know what they're you don't have to know any math to read these things. Okay. You can click a cell, say. You can click victim, open it up, and see a table. So you see all the people that were victims. Um, but these people, say, are just given by personal identif internal identifiers inside the system. We don't know what P105 or P820 mean. So we connect up a fact table that takes a person and reveals uh, their height or their first and last name, etc. We may not know their height completely. We may know that we, their height might be some variable that we have bounded between um, whatever that is, 70, 6, 70 inches and 72 inches. Or we might not know it at all and save it just as a variable, like the height of person 820. But the point is that we, we can kind of collect, connect these guys together, open them up, and see tables of data. Um, and the machine knows some basic logical reasoning, like if you have a person and that person is strong and fast, it can connect that to the conjunction, strong and fast. Um, uh, so you can manipulate diagrams by kind of breaking up these intersectionalities, like these, uh, oh, yep, oh, so I'll call this intersectionality, something that's both strong and fast, um, or by breaking dots. So here we have a picture where a dot is broken off or a dot is broken in here. And what this means logically, uh, we haven't talked about the logic at all yet, but what this would mean is breaking dots is that this guy represents the relation of x, y, z's where x equals y equals z. And this guy represents the relation of x, y, z's where x equals y and z is anything. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of breaking dots, here we have x equals y equals w equals z, and here we have x <coughs> equals w and y equals z. So that's a legal move. The machine understands that you're allowed to do that, and it makes um, logical sense. So this is all regular old logic. Someone playing with this stuff can, like, when, when you're looking at, it's just logical that if a person works at a company that's a startup and another person works at it, you understand, like, what the logic of that is. It's a bunch of ands and equals and stuff. It's just regular logic. It's something people will find familiar, hopefully, but it's got this math-specified GUI that I mean, it's kind of it's pretty intuitive, um, and you might even say you don't even need the math to know what to do here, but at least the math will tell you exactly what you're looking at um, when you try to code this up. It specifies what the GUI should be. So, uh, so you've identified certain sources of and constraints on your suspect. You know the Sue's a suspect. You know the suspect is acquainted with the victim, and you know some other stuff. And to catch your suspect, you must use the venerable chase, which I guess I'm trying to make a pun 
uh, you chase them, but it's actually the name of an algorithm from database theory. So this algorithm says if you start with a database instance, so you know a bunch of stuff, you have this data uh, in tables, and you know some facts, like if someone is, works in the same small company as someone else and they're acquainted, then it will like kind of complete those data, complete that database with all of the known data and all the facts to be um, to contain the old data and to now be true. So you could add axioms like every two people who work at a startup together were acquainted at some time. I've, I've written that in diagrammatic language before, but you could be something like for all p, p prime of type person, there exists a company such that p works in the company and p prime works in the company and the company is a startup. That entails there's some time at which they were acquainted. And all the things, all the symbols here are um, are ones that will make sense in in, uh, in logic. And these this type type of axiom is called a regular logic sequent, or it's also called in database theory an embedded dependency. In logic, it's also called an existential horn clause. It was kind of rediscovered or thought about from many different angles. Um, and algebraic topology is called a lifting problem. And so um, Anyway, you can chase axioms like this in database theory. Right. As I said, it minimally repairs i to some i prime. There'll be a transform or natural transformation from i to i prime, where i prime conforms to the axioms. Okay. And so to complete this detective story, just to finish it off, okay, you created this important cell of all the locations your suspect might be in. And you hook it up to your car as an autonomous driver, and you never have to touch anything. And off you go, and you find the suspect, and you get promoted to Tom Cruise. Okay. So that's it. Um, and the question is, can we make this real? And that's what we're hoping to do, and that's what this talk is part of. Um, so this game, Detective, is not the only game in Regalop the Game. I'll briefly, the plan of the talk is that I'll discuss the math involved, I'll discuss how it connects to the graphical user interface that I described above, and then I'll end by giving lots of other examples of games in this game. Okay, so the, the math is all about regular categories and regular logic. So regular logic is the internal logic of regular categories. I'll say a little bit more about what that means later. But um, for now, um, I'll say what a regular category is. It's a category, it's got objects, morphisms, but it also has all finite limits. So it has a terminal object and it has pullbacks. And it also has what are called pullback stable image factorizations. A map f from A to B, its image, if it has one, is the, small, is the smallest subobject of B through which that thing factors, through which f factors. Um, pullback stable means if you factor f and you pull f back along some other map, then the image of that new thing will be the pullback of the image of the old thing. Whoa. Um, so I'll say that for this talk, to make things simpler, although it seems like I'm putting, I'm taking a regular category, I'm going to take an equivalence or a, a theorem and kind of make regular categories a little bit harder so that the diagrammatic language is a little bit easier. So the little bit harder thing I'm going to say about regular categories is just that I'll say one is fully inhabited. This is something I have not seen anyone talk about, but in logic they often do assume that all types um, are not empty. Um, I'll say that R is fully inhabited if for every object the set of morphisms from the terminal to R is not empty. So each thing has a point in it. Each set is not empty. So, yeah, this is one of these places where like automated view improvers will make this assumption. It's Without you telling really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so regular logic does not make this assumption, but to use this kind of diagrammatic language, um, to use the exact diagrammatic language I'm talking about, you do have to make it. If you want to make the diagrammatic language slightly more annoying, then uh, almost not at all. You wouldn't even notice it, but I don't want to talk about it. Um, you don't have to make the assumption of non-emptiness or inhabitedness. So, for example, the category of pointed sets is fully inhabited, whereas the category of sets is, is, is regular but not fully inhabited because it has an empty set in it. Um, so I have this category of all regular categories and the subcategory of all fully inhabited regular categories. 
So as examples of regular, you don't have to really worry about fully inhabited. It's not going to matter um, for this talk. I mean, it's, it's in the technical part. But the point is, regular categories. So set is a regular category. Any topos is regular. The opposite of any topos is regular. The opposite of the category of topological spaces is regular. The category of models of any Lavier theory, like the mod category of groups or rings or modules, is regular. Uh, the slice of any regular category over an object is regular, and so is the co-slice. And if R is regular and C is any category, then the category of functors from C to R is regular. So they're all over the place, and you can build new ones from old. Um, Wait, don't you also have to say that each model is fully inhabited? Like rule out empty table kind of stuff? Um, I'm not going to talk about models. Okay. I actually, <laughs> yeah. The model will just be a theory. Okay. Um, so a regular category, oh, so how you should think of regular categories is that they are categories that have a good bi-category of relations. Relations make sense in one. Um, you couldn't even write what a relation was if you didn't have the time symbol, so you need products. But you also need pullbacks to compose relations and images to compose relations. Pullbacks and images. So when R is regular, these play nicely enough that you can compose and have an associative composition law. And, and so now rate relations form what's called a locally post-settled bi-category. The category of relations in R just means that for every two objects, uh, there is not just a set of morphisms, but a whole post-set of morphisms. So I can compare two different morphisms for inequality. Um, relations can be composed. That's where we're going to start drawing wiring diagrams and they can be compared, and that's where we're going to start drawing that entailment symbol. And so, if you want to get R back from rel R, it's the category of adjunctions in rel R. So in any bi-category, you can ask, you can define what a real, an adjunction is. Um, in the bi-category of categories, it gives you back the normally definition of adjunction. But it makes sense more generally. And so I think, personally, that every, if you're, if you're a category theorist, you're, you're looking for a problem, you should try um, to prove to yourself that set is the category of adjunctions in RHEL. So you basically take what the definition of adjunction is, apply it to the category of relations, and you're going to get, um, when you ask yourself what is a, an adjunction here, you're going to get two axioms, one for the unit, for the, for, for the two snake equations, basically, that adjunctions satisfy. And those two equations will not, those two um, equations will not look exactly like the definition of function, that every input has a unique output. But it's equivalent to that definition. So you can just prove that they're equivalent. Anyway, the point of all this stuff is that regular categories have enough structure to do regular logic, for the, the point of this slide, I guess. Um, <coughs> so if we think of regular categories as having a good notion of relation, then regular logic, how is it the internal language or internal logic of relation? regular categories. It is in the sense that it is the logic of relations. Um, so that's what logic, regular logic is to regular categories. So if you have relations R of XY, it's a relation of two variables and S of YZ. You can interpret what it means that there exists a Y where R is related, X is related to Y by R and Y is related to Z by S. The AND here, together with the kind of variable sharing of the two Ys, um, it's given by a pullback. Maybe I should, should I write something? R kind of maps to like an X world and to a Y world, and S maps to a Y world and a Z world, say. And the pullback here um, represents the relation between X and Z. It might not be a relation, so you have to take the epi mono, you have to factorize it or take the image of the map from this thing to XZ. But the variable sharing of S and R both having a Y in them is what is kind of given by this pullback. And the exists is given by the image. OK, so the graphical approach to this will be to suppose R is a regular category and to give ourselves a shell. So I'm calling this little simple <coughs> thing a shell for every context. A context in logic just means a bunch of variables with their types. Um, from the point of view of a regular category, it's just a bunch of objects in that regular category. 
So I don't know if it's a good idea to use the word shell and sell. Uh, I go back and forth whether that's convenient or not. Um, so we have a cell, which I mean you have a shell and you fill it in with something that's actually doing something. That's what a cell is. Really. So the cell is a filled shell. And we have, suppose we have one for every, um, for every, uh, for every context. Sorry, a cell, cell means a sub-object of that context, or that product. And wiring diagrams denote combinations of finite limits and images. So let me kind of go into that. Um, here is a picture of a wiring diagram. What does it mean? We've talked about this before, I think, in Seven Sketches and in the seminar. But this is a set theoretic object or a combinatorial object. There's three things wired together inside of our thing, but I can write that down as the three things, gamma A, gamma B, gamma C, each are, are all they are, they look like circles, but I'm just thinking of those four numbers here, two numbers here, three numbers there. And the outer cell, outer shell, has six numbers. Um, the dots inside, W, X, Y, T, Z, U, V, all these things, are here, and the whole diagram is a cospan or correlation. The difference between a correlation and a cospan is that correlations are required to be jointly surjective. So every dot has to be hit, and it is by something. Okay, so uh, one, for example, goes to you means that one. Uh, ouch. One goes to T. That's the mistake. Two also goes. Wow. Oh, okay. That's down here. Okay. <laughs> okay, one goes to T, two goes to T, great. Up here in gamma A, one goes to U, two goes to V, three goes to W, etc. Gamma B is one, is also going to W. So the connection between these two ports is handled by the fact that both of these things are going to, to W there. This entire wiring diagram, not the arrangement in space, but in terms of what's connected to what, is completely captured by one of these and vice versa. There are one-to-one -one correspondence. So what is a wiring diagram? It's a morphism in the operative correlations, if you know what the operative correlations are, is. Um, but another viewpoint, or another way to say it, is it's equivalence relation on the union of, this disjoint union of these four sets. I drew this one down here, these four, these three up there, but they're all just being unioned together and then partitioned. Yeah. So you said that correlations differ from co spans in that it has to be jointly surjective? Yeah. So would that, preclude the representation of, like, does this all contain loop? Like, let's say... Yeah, there's a dot that was, or a loop just in there that, yeah. So if I have a dot that kind of came from some other wiring diagrams, uh, let's see, in this one I have this guy, and in this one I have that guy, whatever, then this thing, when I compose, will just drop off. Okay, so, so everything and, has to eventually connect to some feed there. Yeah, okay. and that's exactly, if I didn't want to use fully inhabited, I would not have that condition. Okay. I would be. Able, I'd allow myself to have those dots, but I'd have to be careful in some slight, slightly more careful in some other way. Now we can convert a wiring diagram like this into a logical expression. <coughs> um, we write a type. Okay, this is a lot. We write the type of each exterior of the exterior shell, naming each port by a distinct variable. So the outer shell here is, has T1, T2, uh, U3, V4. Y5 and C6. I just wanted to name them by different names. Each. Now I write an existential quantifier for each unexposed wire, that's W and X. These are the only two that don't make it outside. So there exists W and X. And then I say that Q holds, oh, all the internal cells now, I end together, take their conjunction. Um, and I have an established variable name for, for each one now. So because all the external guys have been given variable names, and all the internal guys that don't make it out have been given variable names. Um, everything Q needs for its four ports has been given a variable name. There's U3, there's V4, there's W, and there's X. And R has W and Y, five, and S has right, all these things. And finally, I equate variables for exposed ports that are connected, so T1 equals T2. And you can see that all I used here is AND equals and exists. It's, a lo it's a, an expression from regular logic, and it's the definition of it's how this translates into regular logic wiring diagrams. Translate to regular logic expressions. 
So our minority report detective user interface can be roughly understood as, as follows. We have a set T where each type is going to be, or each T is going to be a string label, like person, height, etc. Um, we're going to consider the monoidal 2 category, co-rel T, which is a category of relations in fin set sliced over T op. So you're, if you're, you take the category of finite sets, but to each, finite, to each element of that finite set, you associate an element of this T. So you associate to your finite set. Your finite set is going to be the port sticking out of a shell. To each one of those ports, you're going to assign an element of T. That's its type, like person, height, whatever. Um, and that'll, those will be the objects in CoRel T. The morphisms will be um, relations in FinSet op, which are correlations, which are these equivalence relations, uh, which are wiring diagrams. And the two cells, actually, I wrote it here. I should have just shown that. Uh, the objects are arities, they're lists of types. Uh, the monoidal structure is given by concatenating lists. The one morphisms are partitions or equivalence relations on, on things that respect types. Um, if I want to equate two wires together, they have to have the same type. That's what that says. And the two morphisms are refinements. So the discrete partition, out of all the partitions of this, the discrete one is the largest, and the one where they're all glommed together is the smallest. Okay, so we have that monoidal category, co-rel. We have the monoidal category, post-set. Its objects are partially ordered sets. This is from Seven Sketches, Chapter 1. It's um, maybe kind of. It's one morphisms are monotone maps, and you can equate two different two morphisms, uh, two different one morphisms. You cannot equate them. You can compare them by what's called a natural transformation, which you guys probably all know. And um, so we have this monoidal two category of post sets. Its monoidal structure is um, time. So you can multiply two post sets. You get a new post set. Um, it's, it's got the pairs of objects, pairs of elements of the set, and it's. One pair is less than another if it's less than both coordinates. So um, we're going to consider certain kinds of functors from co-rel to post-set. What those will do is each element of each object in co-rel is going to be a shell with some port sticking out of it. And each one will be assigned a post-set of the cells or the fillers that can go in that shell. Um, and the order of that post-set will be denoted using this logical notation symbol. Okay, we have these two monoidal categories, co-rel and post-set. And what, I, what I'll say in inhabited regular calculus is a lax monoidal two-functor from co-rel to post-set, such that the laxators are right adjoints. It's kind of a mouthful, but it tells you all the structure you need to make this regular logic stuff work. Um, so in our terminology, we call these things Ajax. We call these Ajax monoidal functors because the laxators that you need for a monoidal functor this guy and this guy that take, that kind of can fill a, a cell. If a cell has nothing, no ports on it, then I can fill it with something that will end up being what's called, what's, what ends up being true. And if I have two cells and I put them together, I can kind of and them, and that will end up being this. And the condition, that's just kind of what will end up happening. The only condition is that these laxators have left adjoints. So I'll denote by co-rel alg, and we're getting to the part where we get back to the fun. This is all the technical stuff. But um, co-rel alg is the category of inhabited regular calculi. What is one? It's a T, that's a bunch of types for your wires, and a fee that takes um, you know, each shell and gives you what can go inside of it. And the theorem is that there's a junction between co-rel algebras and regular, fully inhabited regular categories, such that the, such that the co-unit is an equivalence for any regular category. So what that means is, if I have one of these wiring diagram filler things, one of these reg log the game type things that we're going to talk about, a co-rel algebra, a functor from co-rel to post-set, I can turn it into a regular category. And given a regular category, I can turn it into a co-rel algebra. And I don't get what I started with, necessarily. But if I start with a regular category and I go around, although I don't get back the exact same thing, I get something that's equivalent. I get an equivalent category. 
So that's saying that this is kind of a presentation language for regular categories, kind of a syntax for regular categories. Um, we can do a similar thing when you get rid of the star and you don't talk about fully inhabited. You just have to replace corel by the free regular category on a set. By the way, this is something I say all the time when I talk about this kind of thing, but there are two versions of this whole story. One where you talk in terms of operads, where you have nice pictures, and one where you talk in terms of monoidal categories where you have better notation and more people know what a monoidal category is. So I'll switch back and forth between these without saying it. But basically, the translation takes shells and puts them in what I'm calling a trench coat. So you just have like these two, you know, you have a, two kids or whatever, <laughs> and you pretend they're just one big. <laughs> okay, so we want software that will do this detective work, and we're going to call it Reglog the Game. Um, each game, there'll be multiple games, each game would be a set T and an AJAX2 functor from CoRel to PostSet. So remind you what is CoRel T? How would you specify it in, the, in this program if someone was going to make this? This is the slide where they're, they're trying to really understand what's going on here. An object in CoRel T is going to be drawn as a shell and it's going to be encoded as a list. The monoidal product will be drawn as shells in a trench coat or just kind of shells in a wiring diagram. And it'll be encoded as list concatenation. So these are lists of types and we'll just concatenate those lists. Morphisms are going to be drawn as wiring diagrams but they'll be encoded as partitions. And the two structure will be drawn as or shown as breaking dots but it'll be encoded as partition refinement. So that is the first part of the user interface, is like a, a world where you can talk about CoRel T. The second part is that each game developer, so the de detective game, would need to supply their own feed. They're going to supply um, to each shell, they're going to supply all of the possible uh, fillers or cells that can go in there. They're going to supply what it means for one to be less than another. Um, they're going to supply for each wiring diagram a monotonic function that takes a cell inside of gamma 1, a cell in gamma 2, and a cell in gamma n, and produces a cell outside. So they have to provide that function. Um, and they have to ensure to us that their fee preserves composition, identity, dot breaking, etc. Um, the back end for this, at least, detective program could be something like. CQL, category, Categorical Query Language, which has changed its name several times. It used to be FQL and FQL++, then that CQL and AQL, and now it's CQL. It's based on work we've done here, um, but it's another approach to databases that are not just not kind of popping things together and querying them, but using pre-sheaves. So there, a schema is roughly a category and looks like this. This is the subject of chapter three in seven sketches. Um, this roughly word here is just, just that we, you really want to take care that some types have very specific meanings, like string and dollars, whereas other types are more user defined. And an instance is roughly a functor from S to set. And this looks like a graph here, but I can have equations that say things like every department, their secretary works in that department. Equations or, um, or uh, commutative diagrams. Okay, so given one of these things, you could turn it into one of these detective e things, a uh, reglog the game uh, back end, and we can take the reglog the game back end and turn one into one of these. How would we do it? Given this schema, consider each dot not, not just as a shell, so as a shell and as a type. And when you, what shells should, what ports, this should say ports, of uh, the shell employee would be manager, works in, and F name. And the type of works in would be department, which is not only a shell, but also a type. So, these, so then I'll get shells for each dot here. And I'll get, um, and uh, the ports will be the outgoing wires. And if I have an S instance, then I get to fill in those cells. So that's what all of that. You really just said you can't code functions as relations, and relations as functions. Yeah. A set together with a bunch of functions out will be a relation on the product of the sets that it went to. Product returns. 
okay, each regular sequent would be called an embedded dependency in database theory. And as I said before, you can chase embedded dependencies to repair the data. So that's something you can do all within CQL. So if you want a back end for this detective thing, uh, CQL would work well. Okay, now I'll, I'll switch gears and talk about a bunch of different possible applications. The detective one is just one. Um, it's a bunch, so Reglog the game is actually a bunch of games, and what's in common between them is that there's this common user interface and common forms of interaction. So you can create new shells in this GUI, you can attach shells together, you can compose wiring diagrams, you can zoom in and out, you can fill shells with cells, you can fill things with, with meaningful uh, entities that you can interact with by clicking on the shell. And you can do reasoning like entailment, substitution, dot breaking, etc. So that's what's in common through all the different games. Um, the differences are that each fee, each game, gives a world that the cells, world of cells that can inhabit the shells. I think the answer is no, right? <laughs> cells and shells are <coughs> close, right? Okay, but anyway, fillers. Each fee, fee gives a world of fillers. That might even be why. So some examples I'm going to talk about are Where Are My Keys, Smart Twitter, uh, Partitions Game, Boolean Circuit, Solve Equations, etc. Okay. So game one, Where Are My Keys? It's a simpler version of the detective game. There's no, you don't need the reasoning thing, you just query. So you're telling Alexa or Siri or something, you're telling it facts as you get them, like um, I'm putting my keys here, and it sorts your life for you. Um, so you click in, you click where is, which has place, thing, and date, and you get all the stuff you ever told it about where you put stuff. Something from the top drawer, something from the file cabinet, mom's gift is in the basement. Um, you, you, you can query this thing using the graphical user interface. Uh, so you attach keys, which is a subset of all things, some things are keys. You attach keys to thing, and you attach yesterday to date, and you'll find all the places where your keys were yesterday in the database. Um, but you have a similar interface for your calendar, or for your address book, etc. It's all kind, kind of relations. And so you can combine your where it, you know, you're combining lots of different things. And also I imagine there'll be public information repos. So uh, you would want to know cardiologists who fit my availability and who take my insurance. And your availability is on your calendar, and their availability is in their calendar, and your insurance Right. So what happens, there's some internet published doctor cell, which a bunch of stuff coming out of what insurance they take, um, uh, when they're available, what they do, etc. You connect special, one of them is specialty, you connect cardiologist to it. Um, you, you connect its availability and insurance ports to your own insurance and availability port, and you output, you draw a wiring diagram where you don't care about lots of things, you just dot them off, like this. Um, and you, uh, you just want to know their name and phone number. So you're kind of dragging things together, and, and it's a simple user interface, and that's, that's the hope. Yeah. So to, to make this even more real-world applicable, one would have to deal with the problem that standards tend to prolif uh, proliferate, right? Like maybe they're listed as a cardiologist, or as a heart specialist, or as a cardiovascular specialist. Right. So do you think that might like maybe to help out with this, you could also publish some like uh, fuzzy search relations, like this is close to this, and so have this as a buffer. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah. Okay, so here's another. That's the end of game one or game two, I guess. So another game, Smart Twitter. Uh, I don't know why I'm being careful. It's obviously it's supposed to be Smart Twitter. Um, it's just I just like lost a million dollars or something. Okay, so a smarter social network. This is another simplification of a detective game. The difference here is that I'm not going to use, um, I'm not going to open up, be able to open up cells. When you're playing smart Twitter, you, um, you're reasoning and you're blogging concepts built from simpler concepts. So maybe small, wow, what a small world, like you blog, what a small world, like something happened. The thing that happened is you met someone far away from where you were supposed to, you write that relationally, like, um, person that I know, uh, context, um, you know, some other place I met them that's different than this context, etc. So you build up ideas from simpler relations. And people can disassemble or reassemble or nickname concepts that they find. So you're kind of just blogging. The hope is it might maybe it's maybe maybe no one would do it. 
but the hope is that you would, people could blog and put together events, <coughs> and put together uh, ideas and form larger concepts from smaller ones. And then you'd be able to zoom in to other people's concepts to see what they really mean. Like when someone is talking about capitalism or something, it's like, whoa, I don't know what you mean. You mean that, you know, what, or, so you, you zoom in and you see what they mean by capitalism, and it might be different than what you mean by capitalism, and you actually agree with, what, uh, with their assertion. So what's trending in, in Smart Twitter is concepts. Like, I like to know not just a, a hashtag with a name on it, but actually what concepts are being reused over and over again. And hopefully maybe the machine, you can have some kind of machine learning thing that can find them, or some way of identifying what concepts are being reused a lot. For example, if people were blogging about, there's some sub-Twitter sub of people blogging about logic gates back in the early 1900s or something, um, putting together the trans or like whenever it was, putting together transistors, they find adder circuits, um, I guess we're in the 40s or something. Adder circuits are particular uh, wirings together of logic gates, which are particular wirings together of transistors. So adder circuits, out of all the things you could do with 50 transistors or whatever it is, some of them, adder circuits, are throughout your computer. They're just you know, there's tons of them, say. So same with logic gates, they're all over the place. Um, these would be what the machine would say, oh, that's important, adding is important, uh, or is important, but this random logical function is not important, I've never seen it come up. Um, so this reuse of popular concepts like addition is something that would be um, interesting for the computer to find for you. Right, so these reusable ideas, maybe those, that's what a meme is. Um, there's whatever kind of keeps happening over and over in this idea space. Okay, that's smart Twitter. Game three, four is the partitions puzzle, so I'll let you solve this. So here's the puzzle. You're trying to get this, so I want this one to be connected there, this one to be connected straight across, and this one not to be connected anywhere. And you can put these circles in these guys, and you can rotate them, but you can't... Uh, you can't do anything but rotate. So where should these pieces go to get this? Don't know whether this is solvable without <laughs> touching it. <laughs> I know that it's solvable, I mean without like playing with it. I wonder if like kids could get really good at this. I, I have no idea. So here's a solution. Um, you put that one there, that one there, and that one there. And you see that this guy is connected out. This guy is connected there, and this guy is connected to nothing. So that's just a game, I imagine. Like that's the, actually the game part of Red Log the game. That's that's where the fun. That's the most fun, I guess, <laughs> that you can have here. Um, <laughs> Boolean circuits are also special cases of relations. So I guess this would actually be part of uh, the database version world from before. Boolean relations is just a, a Boolean relation, just a subset of true false to the n. Um, familiar ones like and, or implies not true and false. Um, these are all basic circuits, so they're functions. So here's and, it implies, they're just database tables. But less than or equal to is not a database table. Sorry, it is a database table, but it's not a function. It's not one of these things, but true is less than true, false is less than true, and true, false is less than false. And that's a perfectly good Boolean relation. Um, so you can, I, I don't know whether it'd be fun either, but I can, you can imagine people building up, maybe it'd be useful, building up uh, complex relations using simple parts, like for example, less than or equal to is the attachment of true to implies. Um, if A implies B uh, is true, if I make that true, I get the subtable of all things where this third thing is true. True, true, false, true, false, false. I didn't expose this variable, I didn't like take it outside, so I only have a two column table when I've done it. Anyway, so you could imagine, or I could imagine, um, trying to have people build up, like here's the relation, can you get this relation using these parts, and they attach things together, and they get, they get it. Where they go. Okay, uh, another game, solving equations, you have F1 is some, you know, T squared plus three cosine of u minus v equals zero. F2 is some other arbitrary equation. F3 is some other arbitrary equation. And I bolded t, v, and, and z because I want to expose those variables. So what I want are all t, v, z triples where there's some u, 
w, x, and y, such that f1, the equation here, is satisfied. And f2 and f3 and f4, all of them are satisfied simultaneously. So uh, you could solve this as a, with a back end. You could have used the pixel array method or some other method for solving systems. Um, I want to plot all the solutions to a, a system of equations. So suppose you have f of x, w equals 0, and g of x, let's say, w, y equals 0. Um, and you plot each of them in a bounding box. And you think of those two as matrices with on-off pixels. Um, so you have these Boolean matrices. So that is, an equa that is the equation x squared equals w. And that's the equation w equals 1 minus y squared. And each I plotted, so all the white stuff is just zeros, and all the black stuff is ones. So just a little tiny strip of ones here. And now I multiply those two matrices. And when you multiply two matrices uh, of ones and zeros, all that matters is when two ones are in a kind of simultaneous spot. So if you multiply this matrix times this matrix, you get this matrix, which is the simultaneous solution to x squared equals 1 minus y squared, where you don't care what w is. So that's the pixel array method. Um, and so, of course, you can do it when equations, uh, as long as you can plot each of these individually, you can uh, compute their simultaneous solution. So for example, if you just want to know the WZ triples for pairs which these three hold, it turns out to be this funny shape there. So you could, you could, um, <coughs> you could use reg log the game to plot these kinds of solutions to simultaneous equations. Or, uh, sorry, as an interface for that, and use pixel array method as the back end, or some other way of getting all an approximation of all the solutions to a, to a set of equations. So, um, a simpler game, or a similar game, sorry, is that you could assume that each of these guys are linear. They're not just an arbitrary cosine of log of blah, 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 but they're just linear, in which case the outer guy will be linear too. And so that will be a lot easier. Um, it's an ex exponentially smaller matrix used to multiply, basically, and take null, uh, right, to multiply. Um, or to not really just multiply, also uh, all sorts of tensor contractions. But. OK. Um, right. Yeah. OK, so another game, a theory of a group, rings. So monoids, groups, rings, modules, each has an associated algebraic theory. And um, we can choose any algebraic theory or any regular theory, say monoids, and uh, have like a multiplication cell and unit cell. These satisfy various equations which we draw in the system. And then like smart Twitter, the machine could learn common moves. For example, um, noting common proof strategies that you use. So basically, you could, inside the game, you could make something called orthogonal. So in group theory, there's something called an orthogonal group. Um, it's a matrix group. And you could say orthogonal is defined to be a matrix whose transpose times itself is the identity matrix. And so you can start to play with group theory with orthogonal as a new relation you add, or a new subtype you add. Um, and like folded for protein folding, players might be able to help solve I mean, you're not solving general group theory questions, but solving something about your, your um, what are those called, uh, space groups. You might have some complicated group. I don't know. You have some complicated group, and you want to know stuff about it. You want to prove things about it, and it's hard. And so maybe, maybe people could actually help you prove things without even understanding what they're proving. It's totally unclear whether that would be possible. But you could work within a group. Um, uh, in this sort of reg log way. And the last one I'll talk about is Simulink. Uh, MATLAB has a program called Simulink where you can model and simulate dynamical systems. Each one of these guys, as you can see, has a bunch of ports, and the ports are being connected. And what this represents is a relation. You could think of this as a relation in the temporal topos, and, and in any topos, relations form a regular category. So this guy, as a relation, says that whatever's happening on my left ports and my right port needs to be related through time. And so this isn't going to, regular of the game is not going to do simulator for you, but regular of the game can be an interface through which you do, through which you do simulate, um, as well as all the other games. So that's about it. <coughs> we feel ready to make this happen. We want to do this. We want to make this program. Um, the background math is complete, and we understand the data structures. 
at least in a denotative way. Um, uh, experience with Ryan shows that although we have this, if we actually want to make it real, um, actually coding it is going to uncover hidden assumptions. Like I thought of one just now. For example, maybe a player, or I mean, just today, maybe a player can transform the typeset uh, kind of natural morphisms between T's and natural transformation between fees in the middle of a game. Like you might add a new kind of wire uh, during a game, like make a new type, and you might be able to add new um, new elements to um, to a, to new cells to a shell during the game. So that would not be completely written out so far. How the, I, I, I kind of assumed that in, throughout this talk that the T and the fee were fixed for a game. So that's the kind of thing that you have to be a little careful of. Um, but the basic data structures are, are understood. And as you see, uh, I've given a bunch of example games and roughly how they work, but a lot of creativity is required to make these more precise um, and to create new games. Um, and so how to proceed, I have some funding to get the programming effort started, so contact me or Brendan if you're interested in doing something, if you're interested in contributing. Okay, thanks. I really like the idea of reuse of concepts. Do you have a specific way of, of determining which concepts are reused? Are reused? Yeah. Well, if, if, one, if we have some basic ones, um, so first of all, someone maybe I'm, I'm someone who publishes the concept, like my version of what's bizarre becomes really trending. And bizarre is just whatever I think is bizarre, like David's bizarre is like really a cool <laughs> trending concept. OK, um, so you might have some basic things. And then it would be completely known what it, like when I wire these basic things together, that wiring pattern is a co-span. So you would just need to find, just need to find when two co-spans with the same like basic types attached to them are yeah. the same. And that's that's non-trivial, especially when you have axioms that help you prove equivalence in a non-trivial way, right? Right. Like if you have a commutative thing, or your relations are uh, are symmetric. Yeah. So, right. So it's. Okay. Are there algorithms for this, or, you, or is it I, best? There are algorithms for um, proving things in coherent logic, which is actually harder than this. Okay. Um, everything I talked about here could be upgraded to coherent logic. The difference is you now allow ORs, and the chase ha I think is is much harder. And uh, proofs are so it's a more general, more expressive theory, and and so there are. Um, Proof search strategies for coherent logic. So therefore, for it would also be and for first order logic. There are tons of theorem provers, right? Uh, and that's that. even harder. So no chase, but lots of theorem provers. Other questions? Yeah. What computer language are you considering using? I don't know. So, um, so. Ari and others things. have suggested Haskell so that we can get as much, uh, first of all, because it's kind of category theory friendly, and second of all, because we think the kind of person who would want to help <laughs> uh, would be happiest to, for, for, uh, to work there. Um, Ryan has suggested Java because it's where... Because of quantumatic. Because of, first of all, because of quantumatic, which he thinks is pretty similar in terms of what it's, what it's right. trying to do. Yeah. And second of all, because there's better libraries, etc. Can you show it quantumatic? I could yes. just go to quantumatic at GitHub uh, title because there's so much UI tooling here, right? But those yeah. dot yeah, but those dots are um, I couldn't get it to run quantumatic. Today. Uh, get, mm. This guy? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't get it to Where run. Where do you want to go? Just look at pictures of it. That's all. Like the graphs that it can display and yeah. So these guys don't have any text in them. I'm not. I just wasn't sure if it. Um, it's also designed to plug in like theories that have provers attached to okay. stuff. That's good. Yeah. So it's basically it's designed for games. So what, what we kind of also thought was that to start fresh would be more compelling and fun for people than to like take to kind of read the code that went into Quantumatic and try to understand which parts of it to, to, to take. Oh, it's a lot more fun to write code than to read it. Uh, so I don't know, we're, we're thinking about, Paul, we're thinking about lots of different possibilities, and maybe uh, there was one person in Clement who was thinking of, uh, of using Idris. Um, we might have multiple lines going at once. Yeah.
Alex and Java can Scala handle that? Actually, it's his Scala. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, Scala. Okay. Right, so we might have many different projects. You know, lots of different people writing uh, parallel code um, to see, you know, so you can have some cross pollination and also. And yeah. it's uh, the Python bindings there, so if you want to write your game in Python, it's also set up for that. Ooh. Okay. Okay. I, I, mean, I have no affiliation yeah. with that project. Does so that mean that you are actually looking for like many people to code this up, or yeah. or just like anyone you can get your hands on, like as many people? I, I mean, as possible, yeah. Or? I mean, having ten parallel things doesn't make any sense, but having two does. Um, uh, and I have funding for a small, like, I don't have a ton of money for this, but um, for some. So, yeah, I think we're looking for as many as possible to weed out from them. Um, but no, uh, to start and see where the enthusiasm is. And to, yeah. what we really want, actually, is to to make some a basic thing that will uh, a scaffolding so that people on the internet or people who are interested in this can join and and um, have it continue to be interesting. Yeah. I just want to mention there's a related GUI tooling effort at moving the CQL tool to have more prettier GUI looking things. Uh -huh. And so those projects may end up meeting in the middle. I think the related question was whether it was intended for this to do that, but I see you're well, there's oh, overlap, but there, you know, there are some things this is interested in, that, like mm -hmm. nice scope for CQL or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, my hourly rate is zero. That's that's a fixed price offer. Ooh, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, comments? Yeah. So the regular logic axioms look a lot like the open set axioms. Open set? Refer topology, just in the sense that finitary intersection and infinitary union. Right, that's for cohere that's for geometric logic. Uh, um, regular logic didn't exist. allow any unions. But isn't that what the exist is? The, oh the exist is a kind of acts other kind of union. Okay. Yeah. I'll ask you after we're about it. Okay. okay.